This episode is brought to you in association with Janus Henderson Investors. It's for promotional purposes only, is not for forward distribution, and the value of an investment can fall as well as rise. Past performance is not a guide to future performance, and nothing in this episode should be construed as advice. Our discussion is for illustrative purposes only, and references made to individual securities should not constitute or form part of any offer or solicitation to issue, sell, subscribe, or purchase the security. Hello, and welcome to Trust Radio, the investment trust podcast hosted by Janus Henderson Investors, where we take a deep dive into the questions investors really want to know the answers to. My name is Andrew Chiguri, and today I'm joined by Oli Beckett to discuss changes announced by the board, how he's navigating the market environment, and the outlook in a world full of uncertainty. Oli, welcome to the show. Good afternoon. So let's start with changes to the trust. Firstly, you changed the name of the trust, and secondly, you implemented an eight to one share split. What is the objective of these changes? Uh, with regards to the name, we're just being trying to be a little bit more transparent, it does what it says on the tin. We are investing in European smaller companies. With regards to the share split, we're hopeful it might increase the liquidity, might encourage uh, reinvestment of dividends by retail investors, everything to try and make you know, everything a bit more transparent for the retail investor. Now, the strap line for the trust is Europe's winners of tomorrow at the right price. This clearly highlights to me that valuations are an important consideration in your stock selection process. Do you think there's a disconnect in the market at the moment as some investors continue to chase growth at any price? Yeah, I mean, as I say, for us, valuation is important. We can find growth, but we care what we pay for it. Why have people paid very high multiples for stocks in the last few years? Well, simplistically because inflation has been very low and bond yields have been very low and interest rates have been very low so therefore people have been willing to use very low discount rates to discount future cash flows the world is changing you know inflation is there and it's not going to disappear in a hurry and those people that said oh this is merely transient well it's not and obviously the ukraine war has exacerbated that why do people keep going back to these growth names it's what's worked for people that's been their winning strategy for 10 years. That's what people know. A lot of people in the market have actually never seen anything else work. You know, you'll have had to have been doing the job for more than 15 years to have ever seen really anything else work, other than for the odd month or two where values had a little rally. So, you know, and even those of us that have been doing the job a lot longer, you know, we've not seen inflation like this. <laughs> I've seen it in my lifetime, but I certainly wasn't working. It's a long time ago. So that's why people keep going back to it. Why might this change? I repeat, inflation, it's there. So paying these ever higher multiples just doesn't make sense to me. It, it just seems complete madness. Now, some of these stocks have corrected 30, 40%. Quite frankly, I don't see why they couldn't correct another 30, 40%. Why are we paying 60 times earnings, 70 times earnings? But also, you know, there's been a whole machine around this from the investment banks trying to bring all these high growth companies with very little cash flow and very little earnings to the stock market. So they've had a lot of investment bank support. And again, they just go, oh, look, the shares have fallen 20%. Aren't they now cheap? No, they're not. Okay, we will find the odd stock here and there. And that's all we need to do. That is delivering growth at good valuation. It is undervalued. That is what we will do. Despite the market volatility we've experienced, the trust has come to be outperformed its benchmark over the last 10 years. What have been the key drivers of performance and why do European small cap stocks continue to be an attractive investment opportunity? Very simplistically, smaller companies is where you find growth. This is where you find the greater growth. It is very much the winners of tomorrow. You can get uh, access to pure niches, whether that is in renewable investment, whether that's in automation. You know, with larger companies, it's always, you know, 5% of sales here, 10% of sales here. So we can get pure niches, you can get greater growth. Also, there's a greater opportunity for active management, which is, you know, what we're trying to do and add value through active management. It's a less perfect market. There's thousands of companies. They're less well covered. This creates an opportunity. And within that, hopefully we can deliver healthy returns for our investors. Looking more recently, the more growth oriented segments of the market have performed strongly over the last two years. Are you continuing to find opportunities within some of these areas? Yeah, look, these trends are going to continue. Um, the electrification of society, that's going to happen. You know, the move towards renewables, wind turbines, 
connected to the national grid, things like that. Online retail, they're all going to carry on. So there is some structural winners there and it emerged during COVID and it will continue. You know, e-bikes continuing to see growth will continue to see growth. You can see it all around you. The emergence of things like electric scooters and the requirement, therefore, of things like the Internet of Things, i.e. a chip on that electric scooter, well, that growth will continue. There's definitely been some overspend in certain areas, particularly within the home. People have sat at home, probably buying more cushions than they really needed, if you ever need any cushions, but hey. And other areas which suffered during COVID will come back. Travel sector would be a case in point. Be very hopeful that the travel sector will have a good year, uh, you know, particularly as people like Northern Europeans want to go and have some sunshine. So online travel agents like eDreams, you know, they're seeing great orders as we head into the summer. So the trends will continue. There will be some slight nuance who will be the winners this year versus last year. And hopefully we can transition the portfolio towards those winners. But yeah, there's been a big acceleration in some of those trends. Following on from that sustainability theme, ESG is clearly an important part of today's focus and will continue to be for years to come. What advantage does the focus on Europe and smaller companies in particular offer in terms of ESG? Look, Europe's very much been at the forefront in leading this whole sort of ESG drive. And it's a trend that we can invest in. There's growth there, as I say, whether it's towards electrification through you know, companies like Nexans in France de delivering high voltage cables, whether it's insulation companies like Rectocell in Belgium, the opportunity is there. And you, smaller companies area gives you these pure niches to get exposure to these new growth areas. As with any structural trend, there's always an inflection point. The Russia-Ukraine war has highlighted that the dependence on fossil fuels can be economically damaging and also lead to energy insecurity. Do you think this could lead to a deglobalization of the energy markets? And could it accelerate that transition towards cleaner, renewable and more efficient energy sources? Well, the war has clearly led to the West very belatedly sort of you know, worrying about who they're dependent on, clearly. And the, a lot of Europe was dependent very much on, on Russia. And now, obviously, there's, as I say, very belatedly, a look for more energy independence. And maybe things that were being questioned, like gas, like liquefied natural gas, well, now they're being questioned less, and it's going to be, at the very least, at a very important transition fuel. Unfortunately, we've got quite a bit of exposure to things like LNG in the portfolio. Yeah, things are going to change. People are going to question what countries they are dependent upon. That energy independence is important, and it's really focused the minds. And maybe the good thing, hopefully something good comes out of this war, and maybe it leads to greater unity in the West, greater unity in the European Union. That greater unity might lead to things like you know, more consolidation in the banking sector, more rules across the European Union. It might lead to concerns about dependence on China for certain technologies, etc., or for the supply chain. So it's creating change in a, you know, in a very sort of short period of time that also creates opportunity for us from an investment perspective. And I say the prime example is probably LNG, where we're really well exposed. I think one of the key factors that this war has raised has the risk of stagflation, which was last seen in Europe in the 1970s. A high inflation coupled with soaring energy prices or food prices, for example, will reduce disposable income. What is the likelihood that Europe is headed towards stagflation? Firstly, I'd say it's not inevitable, obviously. State the obvious, stagflation, high inflation and higher unemployment. Higher inflation does look inevitable, at least short term, for the next year or two. And where people thought it would be transitory and we'd be heading back towards 1%, 2%, well, we're not heading back towards 1% 2% in a hurry. So there is going to be inflation, you know, and that goes back to you've got to care about valuation when you're looking at equities. A recession is far from inevitable, particularly, you know, if there could be a quicker resolution to this war, you know, and a recession certainly isn't inevitable in places like the US, to be honest, because they have less dependence on, say, Russian energy. So I don't think we should assume there's, there'll be a recession. There should be still some recovery post-COVID, hopefully. Equities will provide some insulation to inflation, you know, much better than, say, bonds. And where it does come down to where would you like to put your money? And equity still looks relatively attractive. 
And, you know, certain sectors that maybe haven't done so well in the past, maybe financials and energy, areas we are overweight, quite unusually in a smaller company's fund, should do relatively well in an inflationary environment. So, you know, hopefully we're reasonably well placed. If inflation gets into double digits and interest rates have to go up two and a half, three percent in the next year, well, then we've got a problem. But we're a long way from that. So I'm hopeful that there won't be a recession. As we've discussed, the fallout from the pandemic has brought about a lot of uncertainty. And this has clearly been exacerbated by the Russia-Ukraine war. What is the outlook for European small cap stocks in this environment? And what are you hearing from your portfolio companies about how they're dealing with these headwinds? Very mixed is probably the truth. I mean, look, there are supply chain issues out there. We were hopeful some of them could be resolved and maybe around semiconductors, maybe some of them are, but new ones are emerging. The vast majority of wire harnesses for cars were made in Ukraine and suddenly they're, they're, there's a shortage of them. So that's impacting the automotive sector. Against that, there's a huge demand for EV cars. We are seeing wage increases more in the 2 3% mark. So it has created some uncertainty. Look, there's no getting away from that. As I say, hopefully a peace deal can be found in Ukraine. Then equities more generally should be a very attractive place to be. And for us, look, it's a vast universe out there. We can hopefully find companies that are relatively well shielded from inflation. And I'm confident we can definitely actually find companies which will deliver growth. But key to that is not overpaying for that growth. I keep repeating the point of going back to valuation mattering. We can find growth. We can find it at a reasonable price. We're going to have companies that deliver healthy dividends, which is a reflection on their strong balance sheets. So, yep, we do need a resolution within Ukraine. We don't want inflation to get out of control, double digit. We don't want interest rates to, again, get out of control, two and a half, three percent. I don't think that's likely. So in the medium term, smaller companies are a good place to be. And you always have to remember, in the longer term, European smaller companies have always, always vastly outperformed their larger counterparts. Great. That's all we have time for today. Oli, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with anyone you think will also find this interesting. If you want to learn more about investment trusts, we have a wealth of information available on our website, which you can find in the show notes. Important information, not for onward distribution. Before investing in an investment trust referred to in this podcast, you should satisfy yourself as to its suitability and the risks involved. You may wish to consult a financial advisor. This is a marketing communication. Please refer to the AIFMD disclosure document and the annual reports of the AIF before making any final investment decisions. Past performance does not predict future returns. The value of an investment and the income from it can fall as well as rise, and you may not get back the amount you originally invested. Tax assumptions and reliefs depend upon an investor's particular circumstances and may change if those circumstances or the law change. Nothing in this podcast is intended to or should be construed as advice. This podcast is not a recommendation to sell or purchase any investment. It does not form part of any contract for the sale or purchase of any investment. We may record telephone calls for our mutual protection to improve customer service and for the regulatory record keeping purposes. Issued in the UK by Janus Sanderson Investors. Janus Sanderson Investors is the name under which investment products and services are provided by Janus Sanderson Investors International Limited. Reg number 3594615. Janus Sanderson Investors UK Limited. Reg number 906355. Janus Sanderson Fund Management UK Limited. Reg number 2678531. Henderson Equity Partners Limited, reg number 2606646, each registered in England and Wales at 201 Bishopsgate in London, EC2M 3AE, and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, and Henderson Management S.A, reg number B22 
848 at 2 Route de Bitbourg, L1273 Luxembourg, and regulated by the Commission du Surveillance du Secteur Financier, Janice Anderson. Knowledge Shared and Knowledge Labs are trademarks of Janice Anderson Group PLC or one of its subsidiaries. Copyright Janice Anderson Group PLC. Henderson Far East Income Limited is a Jersey fund. Registered at Liberty 1923 Lamont Street, St. Helier, Jersey, JE2 4SY, and is regulated by the Jersey Financial Services Commission. <laughs>